Luke chapter 5 is where we're going to go today, this morning. If you weren't here last week, man, you missed a great, great service and powerful message. Pastor Justin, man, he just knocked the message out of the park and he teed it up for our church. I mean, it was just powerful. It was awesome. When he started on the whole, bring them, bring them, bring them. I mean, I was fired up. It was awesome. So hopefully you brought them this week and you continue to bring them the people that need to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've been talking on this message of the one and he touched on it last week talking about evangelism and reaching people and going after people and filling uh, the sanctuary with people so that they can hear the message of Jesus Christ and be touched uh, for the kingdom of God and he talked about that but talking this week about the one this is a challenge for me because this one is one that breaks my heart this is one that uh, is difficult to talk about because I think at times all of us have been this one individual that we're going to talk about this morning in Luke chapter 5 Jesus is going to touch and change someone's life and, and it's an amazing story. It's very short, it's very sweet, but as we get into it, you're going to see how amazing it was, how Jesus healed this person's life in more than just a physical way. You know, this whole series, The One, is really about this, this statement that Jesus came to earth for one reason. He came to rescue and save God's most prized creation. He came for image bearers of God who because of sin have seen the image of God tarnished. He came to restore the dignity back to our existence. He came to bring us back into relationship with the one who made us. Luke chapter 5 verse 12. It says, while Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered or full of leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus meets this guy along the road in this one town, and the Bible says he's full of leprosy. This disease has consumed his body. It's taken over his body. He has this extreme case of this horrible disease. And when this leper sees Jesus, the Bible says that he immediately falls to his face. He's become incredibly insecure. Physically, you, you just imagine the effects of leprosy. I don't know if you know anything about the disease, but it's a horrible, nasty disease. And if it's taking over his whole body, he's likely that he normally would hide his face from other people. It's a disease where, where you lose feeling in, in, in your skin and, and nerves begin to die and literally parts of your body die. They decay. Before you've died, they actually begin to decay. Parts of your body might fall off. It's been said that lepers, it wasn't uncommon for them when they were sleeping so close to the fires to wake up and have their arms or feet be in the fire burning and they didn't even know it. It's not uncommon for them to wake up and have animals eating the rotting skin on their bodies. It's a nasty, nasty disease and he hides his face from Jesus. He falls on the ground. He looks away. You know, I think somebody who has that kind of disease is dealing with more than just a physical situation. They're dealing with an emotional and psychological uh, toll in living that kind of lifestyle as well. He's been trained over time not to look people in the face. He is predisposed to assume that he won't be accepted. So he just falls down and all he can do is beg Jesus. And he says something very interesting. He says to Jesus, he says this wor these words. He says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. He doesn't doubt Jesus' ability. He doesn't doubt that Jesus has power. The leper says, you can make me clean. 
He knows Jesus is able. He knows Jesus is capable. But he doubts Jesus' willingness. What I'm about to tell you next might break your heart for the people that we're talking about today. Or perhaps it will prick your own heart because it's going to hit very close to home. Why would this leper say to Jesus or doubt that Jesus would be willing to clean him? Because no one has ever been willing before. He says, I know you can. I'm just not sure I'm worth it. I'm just not sure I'm worth it. Lepers lived in leper colonies in an attempt to control the disease from spreading. So if you were diagnosed with leprosy, you were cast away from your families, you, you were told that you couldn't be with your kids or, or go back to your job, you couldn't go to your community, you were tossed into a leper colony. A leper colony was a people junkyard. It was where people who were too sick and broken and deteriorated went to be, not to be fixed, but they were sent there to decay and to die. Can you imagine being tossed away in the people junkyard? Just waiting to die. It was a smelly place. It was a lonely place. It was a very depressing place. And if someone healthy did try to reach out to you, they did try and come to you, they did try and comfort you, they did try and socialize with you, perhaps your family missed you so much and they wanted to come to you and they came to embrace you by law, you were required to yell, I'm clean, I'm clean. By law, you were required to tell people to stay away, stay away, I'm not worth it. So when Jesus came, all of these insecurities came to the surface in this man who was filled, filled with leprosy. You know, I'm, I, I'm sure, I'm certain actually, that many in this room this morning are filled with similar insecurities. You don't have leprosy, but something is pushing you to a lonely and depressing place. A state of living and feeling as if you aren't worth it. You know, I worked with teenagers for years, and it never ceased to amaze me the countless number of teenagers that would come to our church, come to our youth services, flood the altars in the youth room, all the while seeming to say or whisper to me, stay away, stay away, I'm not worth it. They, they, they announced it with their attitudes. They proclaimed it with their actions and they promoted it with their clothing. They pushed us away because they had this idea that I'm not worth it. Something in society, something in their past, the past relationship, insecurities in their own life caused them to say, don't love me, don't embrace me, don't come near me, I'm not worth it. And they push away until they experience the love of Jesus Christ. A love that they had never experienced before. Somebody had took their weaknesses, their failures, everything bad about them and everything good and embraced them regardless of what it was. Somebody who just unconditionally loved them. Somebody who was willing to pay it all for them. And they realized a love like they've never experienced in this world. And let me tell you something, these students who came, some of them, they, they weren't the rebels, they were good looking kids. They were sharp, they were clean, they were beautiful. They, they, they were sharp mentally. They had it going on, they made good grades, they were successful in sports, they were successful with their friends, they were popular. But they came still with this mentality, I'm not worth it. Unclean, unclean, stay away, stay away. Now I think there's people in this room that feel the same way. I'm not worth it. 
my past, it exempts me from the love of God. I heard the message this morning during worship about how God loves you and, and somebody came and said, I, I feel like people are resisting the love of God because of their past, because of sin. And let me tell you, that sin will cause you to say, I'm not worthy, I'm not worth it. I know Jesus is powerful enough. I know Jesus can clean me. I know Jesus can touch me. I know Jesus can change me. I don't doubt Jesus can do it, but as Jesus willing because I'm not worth it. This unclean man comes to Jesus and he cries out and he basically says, you can make me clean. Word is that you are powerful, Jesus, and you've been healing all kinds of people, but why would you bother with me? I doubt that I'm worth it. And watch what Jesus says, verse 13. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left this man. Jesus could have just spoken to him. Jesus, from the story we talked about two weeks ago, he could have just reached out and hacked a loogie on him. <laughs> but Jesus doesn't do that, does he? Jesus, it says that Jesus touches him. Jesus touches him. It doesn't say if he just took his hand and laid it on his shoulder. It doesn't say whether Jesus embraced him. It doesn't tell us what Jesus did, but it tells us Jesus touched him. Imagine in this moment what that must have felt like for this man. We have no idea how long it has been since a healthy person, a healthy human being has touched this individual. I imagine it's been a long time because the moment you're discovered that you have leprosy, they cast you out of the colony, they cast you out of the town, they cast you away from your families, and you have to go to these separate colonies right away. And the Bible says that this man was full of leprosy. He was far along in the stages. In fact, I would go as far as to say at this point, he probably looked like a monster. And the Bible says, Jesus touched him. Something very powerful about human touch. You and I all know we long for human touch. There's all kinds of studies that show us the importance of the development of children that at a young age that babies are touched and loved on, that that human touch develops even their mental minds, that touch. You know, I think of when I got back from Argentina, I've been gone for 10 days, I haven't seen my kids in 10 days, and I arrived at Camp Fajola, and there was my kids, and they come running to me, Daddy, Daddy, and embrace me, and there was something powerful in that moment of touch. I think about when I'm away from my wife for any extended period of time and that embrace when you get with your spouse and you haven't been with them and, and all of a sudden that it speaks volumes. It's more than thousands of words. I think of the embrace of a father when you see them and they encourage you and they, you know, and it, there's nothing like that embrace. You know, I've been told by parents who have children with special needs special needs where the child doesn't really uh, necessarily maybe desire touch or want ch touch because of what they're struggling with and, and, and how much these parents just long to embrace their children. There's a longing in it. I mean, you think about just for a moment uh, how insane it is that two sane people, perfectly sane people, desire to lock lips together. It's just weird. When you really think about kissing, it's just weird. It's a weird thing. Why in the world would you want to do that? And yet, we desire to do it. We're drawn to do it. Nobody taught you how to do it. Mom and dad didn't tell you this is how you kiss. Let me show you how. It's just all of a sudden you met somebody you're fascinated with and all of a sudden something inside you longs to touch lips. It's weird, <laughs> strange. In fact, when you're a boy at a young age, you think it's gross. And then all of a sudden, things change. <laughs> things change. It's weird. We long for touch. And here's a man who hasn't been touched by a healthy individual in who knows how long. And Jesus reaches out and he touches him. And when Jesus touched him, he spoke these words. He said, I will. And the leprosy disappeared immediately. 
Those two words, I will, could be interpreted as you're worth it. You have value. You know what I love about this is this is such an awesome description of the power of Jesus over sickness and sin and disease. Leprosy was highly contagious. And in the first century, there was no medical technology to stop it from spreading. So by law, most people were forbidden from touching lepers because of the fear that they would contract the disease. But Jesus' power works the other way. He touches this leper, but instead of getting what the leper had, the leper gets what Jesus had. Jesus transfers power. He transfers wholeness. He transfers healing. And he transfers value back into this individual. Value is restored in this man's life. We live in a region where value needs to be restored. You don't have to look very far this morning to find individuals who feel devalued, who feel lonely, who feel worthless. Any number of reasons has put people in these places. The economy may have put people in these places. Their sin or someone else's sin might have put them in this state. It might be a health issue that's caused them to feel not worth it. Or it just could be a certain phase of life that you're in and you feel like you're not worth it because you live in this phase of life. Let me tell you that the economy isn't helping with this disease. The crime isn't helping And the wide and quick acceptance of sin isn't helping either. There are people that feel a sense of living in a people junkyard. If you looked at the stats of where we live across the nation, let's just say for a moment that you happen to live in Texas and you're looking for a new place to move and you begin to look up the best cities and best places to move to. Let me tell you something. If you look that up, if you Google that, you're going to look at Flint and you're not going to say, that's the place to go. You're likely to say, that's a people junkyard. It's just the way it is. You and I know that's not necessarily the case. You and I know that there's still hope here. You and I know that there's still value here because we know the people who live here. And there's value in people. People have intrinsic value. It's the Omega Day that we talked about a couple weeks ago that each individual has intrinsic value and worth. And the challenge to us is, are we going to show those individuals Jesus? You see, Jesus is still in the restoring business today. He's still about restoring his image in people. Jesus is is not looking at your life and seeing the leprosy. Jesus doesn't look at you and say that you're not worth it. Jesus leans down in your state, whatever state that might be today, wherever you might be, You might be saying unconsciously to every person around you, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, stay away. I'm not worth it. And yet Jesus is getting down on your level and he's grabbing a hold of your shoulders and he's embracing you and he's saying to you today, you are worth it. You have value. Jesus is passionate about people. Jesus had a golden touch that could restore the image of God in the most broken person's life. Jesus told this leper after he healed him, he, he, he told them to get up and he said, you're healed. And he said, I want you to go to the priest and I want you to go present yourself to the priest by law, the law of Moses. The, any person who had a disease, if they were healed, had to go to, Mo, or go to the priest and present themselves to the priest. And the priest would then gather around, they would check the person out, see if they had actually been healed. If they had been healed, then they would allow them to go back to their position in society. Jesus was telling this man I have not only healed you but I've restored you back to your proper position in society he restored value to this individual's life and Jesus would do this oftentimes he would walk into the people junkyards of his culture and no matter who he met 
He saw their eyes, he looked into their eyes, he listened to their story, and he restored value and dignity to their life. You see him put a smile on the face of a woman from an oppressed racial group who was coming off her fifth failed marriage. You see him pull in a close woman who had a physical bleeding disorder for 12 years and he calls her daughter. You see him kneel next to a man with so many demons that he had to live in caves where he was literally chained up, cutting himself and screaming through the night. And Jesus heals him. He sets him free and he uses the man's real name. You see him follow a Roman official who was ostracized by the religious community. Jesus follows this man back to his house and he heals his daughter and he says to him, you may not be Jewish, but you're worth it to me. And you see him touch this leper who had forgotten what it felt like to be touched by another human being. And he says, I am willing, be clean. That's Jesus. That's what Jesus does. It's awesome. And let me tell you something. We've been challenged the last few weeks that that needs to be what Trinity is as well. That's what Trinity needs to be. That's what you need to be. You say, how can I be that? How can I be that? Look at my life. Look at who I am. I'm not a pastor. I'm not an evangelist. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a prophet. I'm not any of those things. Let me tell you something. The Bible says that Jesus gave those gifts to the church to equip the church to do the work of the ministry. Let's not forget that to do the work of the ministry. Every person you encounter is an individual who may be feeling like they're unclean and they're unworthy and they're not worth it. Every individual, they might be hiding behind successful career. They might be hiding behind uh, their personality. They might be hiding behind money. They might be hiding behind success. They might be hiding behind relationships and popularity. But let me tell you something. If you dig deep enough, sometimes you'll discover that they're still feeling unclean and unworth it. And they want to push you away. And they put that other stuff in front because they feel like that's their identity. That's where their value is. Jesus pushes all that stuff away. He pushes it all aside looks at the heart of the individual and says, you have value without any of that. Without any of it. You have value. You're worth it. Those individuals need to know that they're worth it. Perhaps you're sitting here today in our sanctuary today and you're feeling like I'm one of those. I feel unclean. Maybe it's not that you feel like you're in the junkyard of life, but maybe it's you feel like uh, 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 you're there because of something that's going on in your life. I talk to individuals who don't feel worth it because things are going on in their marriage. And they don't feel worth it. They don't feel loved by a spouse. So they've taken that identity upon themselves that they're not worth it. They beat themselves up. They push themselves away from other people. They go into states of depression and loneliness because they feel they're not worth it. I've talked to men who are very successful, seem to have it all together, but feel like they've they've failed secretly in life and, and their secret sin in their life and they're afraid that if they expose it, they'll lose everything and they'll have no value and they'll have no worth. Let me tell you something. Jesus knows your sin. Jesus knows the leprosy in your life. He knows the thing that's eating you up. He knows the thing you're struggling with. He knows the thing that causes you not to look people in the eye. Jesus knows it. He knows every single thing about you. The Bible says he knows every hair on your head. He knows it all. Jesus knows it all, and he still gets down on your level and says you're worth it. You're worth it. I shared this a couple of weeks ago, and I'll share it again. I said you know the value of something by what somebody's willing to pay for it. Jesus paid it all. He took his life and put it on the cross and died for you because you're worth it. No matter how deep the sin, no matter how far you've run away from God, Jesus says, you're worth it. Perhaps you feel that uh, you're not worth it. You're the one today because you've lost your value. You feel you lost because you, you gave your value to somebody else. 
You know, I've dealt with teenagers for years and adults who feel like I have no value because I've given away my value to somebody else. I gave it away and I know it wasn't, I didn't do it in a worthy manner. I know I didn't do it God's way and so I feel like I don't have value to God because I pushed myself away. Let me tell you, when the prostitute came to Jesus, he gave her value again. Jesus sees you that you have value. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come. Perhaps you feel like you're the one today because you're ashamed of who you are or what you did. Perhaps you feel that you don't have value because you've wandered away from God, you've run from God. Let me tell you something. Jesus gave three parables in the Bible about one, the one. He gave a parable about a shepherd who lost one sheep. He left all the others to go find the one. He gave a a parable about a woman who had lost one coin. And she had a bunch of other coins, but she tore apart her house and she swept under the bed and she searched desperately for that one coin. And then he gave the parable that Pastor Trustin shared last week about the prodigal son who who had wandered away and and squandered all his wealth and, 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 and the father waited for the one. Why would Jesus share that to thousands of people? Because Jesus cares about the one. And Jesus is desperate for the one. Desperate to do what? Desperate to restore the image of God in your life. Desperate to make you whole. Pastor Scott said it so well today. Desperate to give you his peace, his wholeness. Desperate to make you right again with the Father. He's desperate. And Jesus is desperately in love with you, regardless of how you feel. Regardless of when you look in the mirror, whatever you see, if I was to hand out mirrors today all across this room or have a mirrors all across the stage, I did this once with the teenagers. I had big mirrors all across the stage. So I preached a whole message where they had to watch themselves in the mirror while I preached the message. And, and as you watch yourself, you become self-conscious, right? You, you're watching yourself. You see something wrong on your hair and you see the students like fixing it in the mirror, you know, as I'm preaching and they're examining themselves. And you know, that if I was to do that today, you might respond different ways. You might look into the mirror today and sit up a little taller, maybe try and suck it in a little more, maybe test your chin fat and see, or, or, you know, you're just going to look at yourself and you're going to see all of the bad. That's just what we do. We see all of the bad and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that because we all want to try and better ourselves. And that's what this leper did with Jesus. He knows who he is. He knows the sickness that he has. He knows how disgusting it is. He knows that he's a monster to the rest of society. And so he falls down on his face, doesn't even look at Jesus. And Jesus' response is so quick and so loving. He gets down and he touches him. And he says, I will, I will, I will, I will. I'm so thankful that no matter how far I get from God, no matter what I do, when I come back to him, he's always saying, I will. I will forgive you. I will love you. I will change. I'll help you. I'll restore you. I will. I will. God's awesome. And his promises are still true for you today. The Holy Spirit's in this place for you. I'm going to ask every head to be bowed and every eye to be closed. And if that's you and you're here this morning and you're saying, Jesus, I just feel like such a, 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 a leper. To our, to our society. I feel like I've had to put up walls that say, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, I'm not worth it. If that's you this morning, Jesus is saying to you, you're worth it. You're worth it. I love you. You have value. You have value. There is a purpose, there is a call, there is a destiny I placed upon your life. 
It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how sick you might be. It doesn't matter how far you've run away from God. It doesn't matter the state of your, your, your job right now. It doesn't matter what your home looks like. It doesn't matter what your job looks like. It doesn't matter, you know, what kind of title you have over your name. None of that matters in this moment. Jesus is just looking at your heart and he's saying to you, you have value. I love you. I'm passionate about you. And in this moment, you might be questioning the different things that you need God to do. God, I need you to heal me. God, I need you to change me. God, I need you to forgive me. God, I need you to restore my marriage. God, I need you to do this. And I think God is saying to you, I will, I will. Trust me, trust me, trust me. Jesus is good and he's faithful. He's faithful. Some of you this morning, you need to commit your life to Jesus today. You need to do more than just surrender this need and this hurt and this pain. You need to surrender your knee to the King of Kings in a way where you say, Jesus, everything that I am is yours. My life is yours. My future is yours. My heart is yours. I'm going to give everything I have to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords for the rest of my life. Jesus, I believe that you are the sacrifice for my sins. Jesus, I believe that you're the King of Kings. Jesus, I believe that you're the one and only God. And Jesus, today I confess that you are the Lord of my life. Some of you need to do that this morning. I encourage you to do it. There's no magical words to it. It's just a matter of you speaking from the heart and saying, Jesus, I need you in this moment. You need to do that. We're gonna open up the altars right now and I'm gonna ask the elders to come and the prayer team to come if you're willing. Maybe you need to be one of the ones at the altar this morning. And and specifically, here's what I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask people to come and to get at the feet of Jesus. Maybe kneel at the altars if you can. If you can't kneel, find a front row and sit in the front row. Just spend some time letting Jesus love on you today. The pastors and the elders who are gonna be praying and their wives and the prayer team, we're just gonna come along and lay a hand on your shoulder and just pray. We don't know what the need is in your life, but I want you as we lay our hands on your shoulder and we begin to pray in agreement with you, I just want you to understand that Jesus is touching you today. Jesus is reaching out and loving on you today. Jesus is restoring value in your life today. We're going to open up these altars and invite you to come right now just to find a place at these altars. Don't don't sit there and think, you know, what will people think about me? What who cares? We're always so worried about what everybody else is going to think or, or what's my spouse going to think or is people going to think there's sin in my life or are people going to who cares? Nobody nobody's really thinking about that. We always think they are, but they're really not. They're probably watching you go and going, man, I wish I had the guts to go. I wish I could respond. I wish I could let Jesus just work on this insecurity in my life. I wish I could confess like they're confessing right now. I wish I would allow Jesus to heal me right now. I wish I could go. I wish I wish I could lay at the feet of Jesus. And sometimes we just resist because of certain things in our lives. And let me tell you something. All you're doing is putting up the walls and saying, I'm clean, I'm clean, I'm clean, I'm clean. And you know what? That leper could have done that that day. When Jesus showed up, that leper could have just said, I'm clean, I'm clean, I'm clean. Pushed away from Jesus. But he didn't. He went and found the feet of Jesus. Sat down at the feet of Jesus or fell at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus touched him and Jesus healed him that day. I believe Jesus has healing for you today and it starts in your heart. It starts in your heart because that's where your value starts. Jesus is looking at your heart and he's giving you value today. Would you allow Jesus to do that this morning? Put everybody else to stand to your feet and uh, we're gonna pray, we're gonna close, but we're gonna continue to have time here at, at the altars. If you're just waiting for whatever reason, it's not too late to come. After we close in prayer, you can come. Uh, don't hesitate. If you thought of something while I'm praying, come. Find healing. Jesus is the healer. Lord, I just thank you, Jesus, that you're the one that pursues everyone. Lord, your word says that your desire is that all would be saved. 
And for that reason, Lord, that's why we still are waiting for the second coming. Because Jesus, you're patient with us, the Bible says. You're patient with us and your desire is for all to be saved. Lord, I'm thankful in my own life when I reach the places where I'm lonely or depressed or far from you or feeling like there's things that have made me unworthy. Lord, I'm so thankful that you never stop pursuing me. Every time I turn around, there you are. Every time I, I, I find myself at my knees, there you are just ministering through your Holy Spirit. Today, Lord, right in this place, right now, all across this room, Holy Spirit, you're ministering to hearts and lives. Lord, you're ministering to the lonely right now. You're ministering to the person who's feeling far from you right now. Holy Spirit, you're healing hearts right now and you're healing lives and you're healing disease right now all across this room. Lord, you're healing them in this place because, Lord, your desire is for us to go from this place to find the one. To find the one. And, Lord, we're going to tell them our testimony. We're going to tell them the good things that Jesus has done for us. Just like in this story, Jesus, you told, you even told the leper, you said, don't tell anybody what's happened. But the, the paragraph underneath that says, but word spread about what had happened. Testimonies are going to come forth after today. People are going to begin to testify of the goodness of Jesus Christ. They're going to begin to tell people about the love of Jesus because they're going to be healed right here in this place. Holy Spirit, begin to heal, begin to heal, begin to heal, begin to heal. And Jesus, I pray that you open our eyes as a congregation, as a church this week to have eyes to look for the one, to look for the one, Lord God, who's feeling like the leper, look for, looking for the one who feels outcast, that we would look for them, Lord God, and that we would be able to reach out to them and, and touch them with love somehow this week. Maybe it's an encouraging word. Maybe we befriend them. Maybe, Lord God, we show them uh, an act of love this week and reach out to them. We send them groceries. We encourage them with a gas card. We, uh, uh, whatever, we bring their kids to church. We do something that we're looking for the one to th this week, Lord. Give us eyes to see, I pray. Open our eyes. Open our eyes, God. Give us eyes like Jesus. In Jesus' name. All across this room, Lord, I pray that, that you would bless these, these people, these individuals, these families. Lord God, I pray that you would keep them. May your, your face shine upon them this week. Lord, may they experience the good things of your hand. Lord, I pray that you anoint the elders and the pastors as we pray. May we, we be Jesus to these individuals right now in Jesus' mighty name.